Bibles, please open to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. I want to speak this morning about focus. Now, most of you watch Pastor Scott walk out here and put a table on the stage. It happens in the church service that uh, during the service we will have things happen that will take our focus. It's amazing what will catch our focus and catch our attention during a church service. Remember when I grew up, where the church that I grew up had windows from almost from floor to ceiling, but not quite, it was about halfway up, all the way to the ceiling at the church. And I tell you what, it seemed like every single Sunday there'd be a bird that would try to fly into the church. Dink, dink, dink. I, I mean, there are sermons, I'm sure the pastor was just preaching his heart out. And here I am, a 14, 15-year-old boy. All I can see is that bird. Dink, dink, and you think, oh my, are, are they going to die? Is the bird going to collapse? Is the, grass gonna, is the glass going to crack? What's going to happen? It's amazing how much focus can affect us. I was in Chicago at an air show, and I've told you this before. We're watching the airplanes here, and it was the Thunderbirds. I turn around, and I see two loop around behind us, around the skyscrapers there in Chicago, I remember watching those and thinking, they're going to come back flying through. And while the crowd had their focus on these planes, all all of a sudden, these two from behind came over. It felt like four feet above our heads, a little bit higher than that, on afterburner. And because the crowd was focused here, when the planes came over their head, everyone screamed. Focus. A few years back, a number of years ago now, was a Sunday afternoon. I got up for my normal Sunday afternoon nap. I'm guilty of a nap almost every Sunday. I'm proud of it, and I cling to it. I think it's in the Bible, and it's not really, but I love it. I love it. Got up to use a restroom, and somehow was focused on walking to the restroom that I missed the corner of the wall. Now, when I say missed, I don't mean like I missed it physically because I didn't miss it physically. I missed it visually. Man, I smacked that corner right here, right between my eyes, right down my nose. Sunday afternoon, I was getting up to come back for orchestra practice. It's one of those times you look at that gigantic red mark. You're like, I wonder if anyone will notice. And we have such a loving and compassionate church. I just was so encouraged this day. I was leading songs then. And so here I'm leading songs, and some of you, some of you, which will go unnamed. We're pointing and like this. From out there to up here. Focus. Can affect us, can it not? I'm sure if we took time today, we could all share stories about a time that we focused on the wrong thing. Perhaps uh, you were playing basketball and you focused on the wrong hoop and you scored for the wrong team because of focus. Or perhaps you were walking and tripped over something obvious because you were focused on something else. Focus. It can really affect us. This morning we're going to look at a passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 23 where Jesus Christ will direct our attention on something to focus on as a believer, as a Christian. What Jesus, as he teaches us, what we will find is that sometimes, believe it or not, We can focus on the wrong spiritual thing. Can you believe that? I won't ask for confession. I won't ask for acknowledgement. But if we're honest, I think we can all identify with that. Where times we've missed the mark a little bit. Where we've not been focused on the right thing. It's got our attention off the calling that God has called us to. But my friends, it is so important. It is vitally important. That as a Christian, we focus on the right things in our Christian life. Though it is perhaps scary to be in an air show and to forget to focus on the planes coming behind you. And though it may perhaps be embarrassing to focus on the wrong thing in the house and miss the corner of the wall, it is far more devastating. To walk a path with God and to focus on the wrong thing. When we miss our focus in our spiritual life, we become blinded to our flaws. We magnify misjudgments. We exalt irritations. 
and we justify our own reactions and actions, all stemming back to a simple problem of focus. We asked this first week in Matthew, who's your king? We asked, what's your story? And last week, what's your problem? Today, the question on the screen that I want to challenge with us today, or challenge to us today is, what is your focus or what's your focus? And I hope that as we look at this portion of Scripture, that before we leave the day, if your focus is not accurate, is not right, that you will put your focus back where it needs to be. Have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 23. This morning we'll be over most of the chapter and parts of it, but I want to direct our attention this morning, particularly to verses 10, 11, and 12, where Jesus says this, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master. Even, and what's the word there? Christ. Who is to be our master? Christ. So who is to be our focus? Christ, our master. Who is your master? It's Christ. One is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. When you put your focus on Jesus Christ, very quickly you realize your inadequacy. When you put your focus on Jesus Christ, very quickly you notice how inept and unable you are when you look to Jesus Christ. When you focus on yourself, when you focus on others, it is easy to justify. It is easy to exalt yourself. Well, I'm not as bad as fill in the blank. I may not be as good as someone else, but I'm not as bad as them for sure. Boy, have you seen them? If you talk, their attitude's terrible. And I'm, I'm not there, that's for sure. But when you put your focus on Jesus Christ, you realize just how good he is, just how holy he is, and you realize what he wants to do in your life. My Let's go, Lord, in prayer if we can this morning. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you for the moments that we have together as we look at your word, and I pray that you'd help us this morning. Lord, please illuminate this issue and the solution. Lord, I pray that if there's issues in our heart, in our life, that we are faced with in a a focus problem, that you'd help us this morning to refocus, to put our attention, to put our eyes back on you. Lord, we love you in Jesus' name. I pray and ask for your help this morning. Amen. In this chapter you will find that Jesus Christ is going to go after a certain segment of people. Now, throughout Christ's ministry, the Bible says that he went about doing good. Jesus Christ went everywhere, and he taught in all of these cities and all these places, and he was so gracious and so kind to almost everyone. He didn't make a difference if someone was rich or poor. He didn't care about that. He didn't care if they were even good or bad. In fact, he says those that are are healthy, they don't need a physician. Those who are sick need a physician. right? You you need a doctor when you're sick, not when you're feeling great. But there was a certain segment of people that Jesus Christ did not put up with their antics. In the Bible, we know them as the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Some were called lawyers, not in our sense of lawyer, but they would know the law and they would articulate the law. And these people went after Jesus Christ. In fact, they tried to trip up Jesus Christ by asking hard questions. Just on a side note, you can't ever out-question the Savior. And that's a different series of sermons, but there's one point where after Jesus answered one question, the Bible says, and after this point, no man dared ask him any questions. He always had the right thing to say at the right time. They tried to trick him, but you can't, Chris, you can't trick Christ who is the word of God. But the Pharisees, they had an issue that we'll see in this chapter where they thought, they thought they were better than they were. 
Have you ever met anyone like this? Don't raise your hand and don't point. But I imagine by your reaction like I have, you've met somebody who thought they were better than you. Maybe it was because of their economic standing, where they thought they were better because they had more wealth than you had. You interact and they think they look down their nose at you. You're like, well, who do you think you are? Maybe you met someone this way who it was that way because they thought they were better athletically than you were. Or intellectually smarter than you were. Or perhaps even you met someone who thought they were better than you because they were a better spiritual religious person than you. It's probably the highest form of hypocrisy. They think you're better than someone else just because of the way that someone acts. This is what the Pharisees did. They looked down on everyone else. In fact, when they prayed, Jesus said, we find out that they prayed this way. They prayed, Lord, I thank thank you that I'm not as this, this sinner down here. Can you think of that? The pride in that. Can you imagine? Brother Krishmar prayed for us this morning, right, to start the service. Can you imagine? He didn't. But what if he prayed, Lord, I thank you I'm not like, and he mentioned one of your names. (laughs) What would we do? You know, tackle him out of the pulpit? But this is what the Pharisees did. And Jesus, in Matthew chapter 23, he began to describe the problem and deal with their focus. He's going to tell the Pharisees in this chapter, you have the wrong focus. You are looking and you are judging life by the wrong things. You have thought that you were special when in reality the master, Christ, is the special one. You have the wrong focus. Look at three truths from this passage, Matthew chapter 23. Look first of all, beginning in verse number 25, if you would, as he deals specifically with the Pharisees. And he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, But within, they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness." Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Our friends, this morning I want to point out to us very clearly and very plainly from the Word of God that sometimes people are only consumed with the externals. What happened with the Pharisees, Jesus says, you have been consumed With the externals. You have made sure that the outside looks really good. You have painted the house really well, but the foundation is cracked. You've pulled out the dings from the car, but you forgot to mention it was in a flood. The outside looks really good, but your inside is terrible. He calls them whited sepulchers. And what he means by that is there were some beautiful, ornate places where people would be buried. He said, the outside is beautiful, it's ornate, but inside is just a bunch of dead bones. There's no life there. Now this morning, I'm a little thirsty, so I brought some water with me. I need to be shaken up a little bit first. Oh, that's good. This is the Pharisees. Consume with the outside of the glass. Do you mind if I take a drink? <laughs> well, mixed reactions. Some of you are like, gladly, Pastor, knock yourself out. Some are like, this is disgusting, this is gross. What happens when you interact with dirty insides? You know what happens? It pollutes. 
The outside's fine. I can lick the outside. Yeah, no problem. Delicious. But this inside, it's nasty. See, the Pharisees were consumed with making sure the outside was so polished that it would shine. Boy, Crystal, man, if I tilt this just right, you can look through it. Man, it's, it's perfectly clean, the part you can see, right? Can you see that? I mean, perfectly right, right, right there at the top there. So clean, so crisp. You all could lick it, not at the same time. I mean, no problems. But the inside is filthy. The inside is dirty. And my friends, there are times that people become consumed with the outside and forget about the inside. And this doesn't just happen to Pharisees. It happens to, to those who go to church every single week. And they make sure that they're, that they're dressed real nice and they, they bring a Bible and they stand up and sit down and they smile and they, oh, hi, pastor, and oh, such beautiful words. And the outside is all nice, but the inside is filthy. And Jesus said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, because you've worried about the outside over and over, and you've made sure this is polished, and you've made sure you appear just right, but inside you are dead. And your focus was here, but it wasn't here. Because your focus wasn't here, then any interaction brings pollution. That's why Jesus said, be careful of the Pharisees because of their doctrine. It'll cause you to stumble. It'll pollute you. It'll defile you. What he's saying was not their outside, but he said, as they teach you, because their inside is not right. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Because the inside isn't right, then the outside will affect everyone else. And too often, we're consumed with the outside and we forget about the internal. They looked good. They acted good. They were high and mighty. They were well respected, but they were filthy. They cleaned the outside but ignored the inside. They worried about washing their hands while inwardly ravaged with a disease. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to go to that church because they're full of hypocrites. And what they mean by that often is that, well, that church, those people make mistakes. My friends, making a mistake does not make us a hypocrite. If it does, then we are all hypocrites, pretending that we don't make mistakes, pretending that we don't have problems, pretending that we don't travel the path everyone else travels. That's what makes us hypocrites. My friends, here's the issue. When we're consumed with the externals, what we end up with is just a covering of religion. When we're consumed with the externals, all we have is just like a coat, a paint job, a little bondo. Whatever you want to use, all we have is a covering of religion. You ever get tired of Christian bumper stickers? Why, doesn't it see, why does it seem that the worst drivers have the fish in the corner? Jesus is my pilot. Oh, no, he's not. Whoever's driving that, of every, who's, I don't know who's driving, but it's not Jesus. He's not driving that vehicle right there. Christian jewelry around the necks, Christian videos for kids, magazines of Christianity on the coffee table, but no actual love of Jesus and no focus of Jesus in a life. A covering of religion, but brokenness, defiling, dirt, deadness on the inside. I read a story about a man in a parking lot. He hit a car. This happens sometimes. Hit a car and then pulled off, began to write a note. Placing the windshield. This is what he wrote in the note. He said, there are people close by who are watching me. They think I'm leaving you my name and my phone number, but obviously I am not. <laughs> A covering of religion. And my friends, sometimes we try to cover our religion, all right, with just a covering of church. We say, well, I go to that church. And listen, you ought to go to church. It's good to go to church. I love coming to church. I love coming to First Baptist Church. I love this place. But coming to church doesn't make us religious. 
It's the outside. Sometimes we think we can buy our way to goodness. Well, I'll pretend that issue isn't there. I'll just be really nice. It's not recovering. Rather than deal with the problem and seek forgiveness, the proper channels, and rather than focus on Jesus Christ and have his forgiveness and repentance, I'll just act right. That's the outside covering. The outside covering. What about that little boy who had problems in class sitting down? The teacher said, now, Johnny, you need to sit down. Johnny, you need to sit down. Finally, one day it came to head and just was out of control. She said, Johnny, listen here. If you don't sit down, you're going to the principal's office. I'm going to call your parents. There's going to be a serious issue. So Johnny sits down. And he says under his breath, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. And my friends, that kind of attitude, that kind of thought, is this right here. Where there's outward conformity, there's outward covering, but inside, inside there's vileness, there's dirty, there's deadness, brokenness. My friends, we got to focus on Jesus Christ. But that's not all we see in this chapter. If you look back in, uh, um, or look, I'm sorry, look back in verse number 23, I want to point our attention to something else. Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye pay tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Now Jesus says to these Pharisees, Listen, you've You've done some things that are exactly right. You've tithed off these things you've given, but you've ignored. The big deals. You've ignored some big concepts of of judgment and mercy and faith. But notice what Jesus said at the end of this verse. These things ought ye have to have done and not to leave the other undone. What happens is because this seems so repulsive, sometimes some people are only consumed with the internal. And they get the focus right on the inside, but then they say things like this, it doesn't matter how I live, Jesus is just concerned about the inside. Now help me here, quiz time, is Jesus concerned about the inside, yes or no? Absolutely. But Jesus said here, listen, these things ought ye have done. He didn't say to stop doing those things that that were religious, that were right, He said, that's not the main focus. He said, don't just clean up the inside and forget the outside. We have Christians who claim this right here. It doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter the choices I make. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I have grace from Jesus, and I can live like I want to live. I can do what I want to do. My friends, the Bible says, what know ye not that you're the temple of God? You're bought with a price. We have believers who are on the inside real good, but on the outside, filthy. Now I'm thirsty again. Can I take a drink out of this one? Man, no one cares, right? Hmm, that's good. I'm not going to lick this one, am I, though? (laughs) Interesting. Because here's what happens when only the inside's clean then any interaction with the outside affects other people. Any life that we would touch would be hindered by the dirtiness on the outside of the vessel. You see, being concerned only with the internal will hinder your message to the outside. I read about a man. He was an office manager and he lost his job during a reception. In his sadness, he wandered to a park and he sat on a bench in the park and before long, another man came and sat down next to him. They began to share their woes and their sorrows and the first man said, I've lost my job. I can't support my family. 
The second man said, well, he said, I'm a circus owner. He said, last week I was making lots of money. I had this famous ape and everyone would come to see the ape and the ape died. The man said, the other man said, well, he said, I, I need a job and you need an ape. He said, I'll put on the ape costume and we'll make some money together. Well, the circus manager wasn't sure it would work, but said, why not give it a try? So the man who'd lost his job, the office manager, put on the ape costume, showed up at the circus, and for whatever reason, it was a hit. They thought the, the real ape was successful, but the fake ape was super successful. People flocked for miles to watch the show. But one day, one day, things got out of hand. One day in the midst of the show, a lion got into the cage with the ape during his show. Crowd begins to scream in terror because this lion is obviously on a, on a hunt. The lion's going to start to attack the ape and runs after the ape. The ape is now the man inside the costume is just scared beyond his measure. He screamed, he gasped, and finally, to the horror of the crowd, the ape yells, help me, help me. And to his surprise, hear the lion mutter, shut up, stupid. Do you think you're the only one who lost the job? You see, when our inside and outside don't match, we hinder the message. Now remember, just the outside is the wrong focus. But don't miss this. Just the inside is the wrong focus. So what do we do? Jesus teaches us this. Jesus taught this. Clean the inside to clean the outside. Look back, we read it in those first set of verses. Look back in verse, uh, in verse number 26. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You see, you can't clean from the outside in. There's nothing I can do to clean my inside from the outside. But Jesus said, when you clean the inside, you ought to let it affect the outside. That when you follow the teaching of Jesus Christ, all right, you will have the right kind of focus, which is the inside. You have the right internal. You have the right external. And you can be that vessel. You can be that person. You can be that living testament, that living example to all. This is what a life looks like that's been touched by the power of God. I can't help but remember when Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, let your light so shine before men that they may see what? The external, your good works, that have now flown from the inside and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, what God wants is not just the outside and not just the inside, but what God wants is a vessel, is a temple, is a person who focuses on the Master, Jesus Christ, who keeps his eyes toward the prize, allows the Word of God to cleanse and to clean and affect not only the inside and to change our motivations and to change our attitudes and to change our interactions, but then change the outside. We're a new creature. And all of a sudden, this old man, this old person, before Jesus Christ moved in, they were cranky, they were rude, they were a jerk. They had addictions and habits and struggles. But when Jesus Christ moved in, he changed the inside and the outside. This is what God desires in the life of a believer. You see, when you clean and focus on both, it keeps your eyes in the right place. You see, when you're focused here, when you're like this, you look at everybody else. So the Pharisees did. Look at that person. Look at that person. Look at that person. When you're like this, you look at yourself. Look how good I am. Yeah, this is, look how good I am. When you're like this, you're focused on Jesus Christ. My friends, this morning I wonder, what's your focus? Who are you looking to? 
Have you tried to put a covering of religion on? A cover, a covering of spirituality? I'll be in church, I'll, I'll sing at the right time, I'll, I'll do these little things. My friends, that will never change anyone. Have you ignored the outside? Have you justified no change out here because God cares about the inside? Or have you allowed God to transform you from the inside and display his likeness on the outside? Clothing retailers often will make those or ask those who work for them to wear the clothes they sell. In the fashion industry, they call this term guard the brand. Guard the brand. And wouldn't it be a shame if clothing stores were more concerned about guarding the brand than Christians? Wouldn't it be a shame if at the mall they were more concerned about their employees than as believers who have been touched by the power of God to guard the brand? My friends, I know in my life, in my life I want to guard the brand. I want others to see Jesus Christ this way, they'll walk away with terrible interactions. This way, they'll be, they'll be muddied by the interaction. But this way, they can see Jesus Christ and his power. It's not me, it's him. Guard the brand. If Jesus were speaking today, he might have said, Listen, Pharisees, you look like a great car with a blown engine. A beautiful cake filled with salmonella. You might look like a specimen of, of a human but filled with cancer. A beautiful home with a cracked foundation of termites. But true faith is no superficial faith. True faith flows from the inside to the outside. True faith displays the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There was a man. He made free use of a Christian vocabulary. This man talked about the blessings of the Almighty. And some Christian confessions would become the pillars of his government. He assumed that the earnestness of man was weighed down by historic responsibility. He handed out pious stories to the press, especially to church papers. This man would show his tattered Bible and declare that he drew the strength for his great work from it as scores of pious people welcomed this man as a man sent from God. Indeed, Adolf Hitler was a master of outward religion, but no inward reality. So what's your focus this morning? Are you dead on the inside? My friends, Jesus Christ came to revive and to save those who are dead. He, he said, I have come to offer life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And his gospel will absolutely transform your life from the inside out. But only he can do that. My friends, let's focus on our master, Jesus Christ. Lord.